Uh, so thank you, uh, Neil, for, for that uh, generous uh, uh, introduction. Uh, but, but thanks especially for the invitation. And of course, I should thank uh, you know, not just you, but also the history department and the Africanist community at Wisconsin for, for the invitation and for making this possible. Uh, I should qualify my lecture this, uh, you know, this afternoon uh, by saying that what I'm going to be presenting to you uh, is raw. A raw in the sense that it's a new project, but also raw in the sense that it involves a lot of pain, a lot of trauma. And uh, with that said, I, I want to acknowledge that among the attendees today, uh, a man who were either victims or eyewitnesses to some of the crimes that I shall be talking about. And I want to acknowledge their presence. I want to acknowledge their generosity. And I also want to acknowledge their fortitude. I also want to acknowledge uh, the, uh, the hard work uh, that South African journalist Chris Dane uh, you know, has put into this project. Uh, she wasn't able to continue with the project for all kinds of reasons, uh, but I, I think uh, we need to acknowledge the effort that she put into this, uh, the hard work that she put into this. Uh, and uh, so I wanna, you know, I wanna just, just do that. Uh, I have decided uh, for the purpose of this talk, and of course, I, uh, before I forget, I should also just thank all of you for, for tuning in. Uh, you know, I know you're coming uh, from different continents and you're coming in at, uh, at, at different times. Uh, so I appreciate your presence and I, I appreciate your time. Uh, and I'm just gonna go ahead and share uh, my screen uh, with you. Uh, there we go. Uh, yeah, so I uh, have decided to call the, uh, the talk that I'm giving this afternoon, The Mind of Apartheid, History of the South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And I'll explain uh, the title in a second. Uh, but before I do that, I uh, want to just say that I deliver this lecture, uh, and, and again, thanks to, to Neil and his colleagues in the history department and the African studies program at Wisconsin for the invitation. I deliver this lecture in honor of Jan Vansina. I speak to you in some ways as an intellectual grandson of Vansina's uh, because my PhD advisor at Yale, uh, Bob Harms, was a student of Vansina's uh, at, at Wisconsin. But I also want to deliver uh, today's lecture in memory of a remarkable scholar, uh, Bill Freund, who died in August. Uh, you know, quite tragic, uh, quite sudden, and quite unnecessary. I'm not suggesting that deaths are ever necessary. Uh, and in some ways, I want to make this lecture an engagement uh, with some of uh, Bill's uh, work. Uh, I want to uh, deliver this uh, in the form of a response to some of uh, Bill's provocations about the state or the status of South African historiography. As those of you who work on South African histo you know, history will know, South African historiography is at an impasse. Uh, it's at an impasse in the sense that uh, for years now, uh, scholars have been lamenting the absence of black historians. Scholars have been making the argument uh, that you know, if only there were more black historians, the South African history would be different. But it's never been clear what the difference would be. Uh, it's never been obvious to anyone uh, you know, what that would look like. And here, you know, Bill had something profound to say in an essay uh, titled The Art of Writing History, which he published uh, in 1994, where he made the argument that part of the problem uh, is that the key traditions uh, of South African historiography were, in a sense, traditions uh, that were within one master narrative. And that master narrative, as he put it, was the struggle uh, with capital letters, right? So capital letter T, capital letter S that you know, the so-called liberal historiography about the contact between the native and, uh, and the outsider uh, and the so-called radical historiography right, about the relationship between race and class were essentially uh, a quibble over this one master narrative uh, called the struggle, that they were driven uh, essentially by this urgent moral need uh, at one level to respond to the struggle and its demands. And Bill suggested uh, suggested in, 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 seriously that uh, what we might want to do is write a history of South Africa that was not about the struggle, or that was not directed at the struggle, right? A history that in some ways displaced a struggle, but also a history that displaced apartheid. So what might South African history look like if told not as a story about apartheid, but as a story about something much different? 
And this is what I see in some ways as my challenge this afternoon. And this is what I'm going to try and do. Uh, but, but just for you to keep in mind that this lecture is both in honor of Jan Vincina and his remarkable legacy, uh, but also in memory of Bill Freud. Uh, you know, and his, uh, you know, remarkable generosity, intellect, uh, and, and, and insight. So, to the title. I want to explain the title because in some ways it's a controversial, cho a controversial choice. The title uh, is taken from an essay that uh, J.M. Kutsia, uh, the Nobel uh, laureate, uh, but also uh, one of South Africa's preeminent novelists, uh, wrote uh, uh, in 1991. Uh, and, and the uh, essay was titled The Mind of Apartheid, uh, Geoffrey Grenier, uh, 1907. Uh, so when, uh, you know, of course, uh, when Kutsia wrote his essay, Grenier hadn't passed away, but he, you know, he died uh, in 1992. So I've added, uh, you know, I've added that. And I want to take from this essay that Kutsia penned in 1991, uh, this one quote. Uh, he says, and I'm, I'm going to read here, like Poe's detective, looking for the hidden letter in the most obvious place, mm -hmm. we ought at least to entertain the possibility that what animated apartheid, uh, sort of what animated apartheid worthies may have been not the altruism they claimed, but on the contrary, the crassest absorption in their own passions and appetites that their utterances may have been a cover for the deepest indifference to the fate of their descendants. And of course, what, uh, what Kutsia is trying to argue here uh, mm -hmm. is that uh, South African historians uh, you know, have been blind to the passions driving key apartheid ideologues, that South African historians were missing uh, you know, the story of madness uh, built into, uh, into apartheid. This is controversial because what, what, what Kutsia's essay did was essentially to dismiss the need for social explanation, to dismiss the need uh, for historical context. Uh, and and you know, uh, historians, uh, Jonathan Heslop uh, and, and Saul Dubow, you know, were among the first to point out the shallowness, but also the potential dangers inherent uh, in Kutsia's uh, in, in Gutierrez's argument. But I want to hold on to this idea that apartheid had a mind and, and that within apartheid there's something we might call madness uh, as a way of explaining, uh, you know, apartheid itself as a phenomenon uh, that what drove uh, some of apartheid's key ideologues, you know, a man like the sociologist, uh, you know, Jeffrey Cognier, who is at the University of Pretoria, uh, were these personal passions that then got animated because they were married to power. So what happens when you marry passion to power, uh, then you know, about it becomes, uh, becomes the outcome. So what are my key research questions uh, for this uh, lecture? The key questions I have uh, are the following, and these are not exhaustive, and, and, and you will see uh, you know, uh, from the lecture that this is a raw project, right? It's not well refined, uh, that it's, it's a work in progress. Yeah, but these are my key uh, research questions as of now or as of today. What happens to South African historiography when we shift the angle of vision away from racism to race, right? So what happens to our history as we understand it when we start looking for racism and its effects, but we look at the construction of race as both a common sense, but also as an institutional feature of our society. Right. So what happens when we decide that instead of taking whiteness for granted and assuming we know what it is, uh, blackness for granted and assuming we know what it is, uh, we take a step back and say, how about we look at the racial common sense that develops over time and comes to define what it means to be white in South Africa, what it means to be black in South Africa. And I'm using here the term black in its capacious a sense to include people of African descent, people of Indian descent, and people of mixed descent. So that's what I'm trying to do. And that's what the first question is trying uh, to, to do, essentially. And then the second question is, what happens when we examine the workings of apartheid as a system from the perspective of its beneficiaries as opposed to its victims? Right? So what happens when we start to look at the effect of apartheid on white South Africans or people uh, classified under apartheid as white? And I should add very quickly that this is not another whiteness study. Right? I'm not interested in white fragility. I'm not interested in, in, in another story about the whiteness, uh, you know, and, 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 and it's, uh, you, know, uh, you know, many uh, uh, codifications. That's not my interest at all. But my interest is in trying to understand the lived experience uh, of people classified white under apartheid and, and, and what that might tell us about apartheid itself and how apartheid worked or didn't work. 
Right? And the third question I have uh, guiding me here is, how do historians write about people who do bad things in history? Right? How do we write about people who do awful things in history? Right? So this is a question about ethics. It's a question about responsibility. Put another way, what courtesies do I owe the man who is at the center of the story? Right? What courtesies do I owe him? What do I extend him? And what do I uh, you know, pull back from him? And this, to connect it to my previous work, is, is in some ways yet another response on my part to the Truth Commission and what the Truth Commission has made possible. Right? What I'm trying to do here is to engage with that literature coming out of the Truth Commission that has given us, I think, insights uh, you know, that, that are much more productive than what uh, you know, uh, Alan Feldman has called the sociology of the obvious. Right? So to say that the Truth Commission didn't give us the full truth, uh, that the Truth Commission didn't give us reconciliation, is to engage in what uh, you know, Alan Feldman calls the sociology of the obvious. Right? What happens when we go beyond the sociology of the obvious to look uh, you know, much more uh, seriously at, at, at some of the deeper engagements uh, with the Truth Commission and its meaning for South African history and South African historiography. And here I have in mind uh, four scholars uh, whose insights and thoughts about the Truth Commission I think are good for thinking with. Right? I want to start with Mahmoud Mamdani, uh, you know, who makes a point uh, that the Truth Commission ignored political responsibility in favor of individual responsibility for violence, right? That in taking uh, what he sees as a Nuremberg approach to the wrongs of the past, what the commission did essentially uh, was to individualize uh, you know, responsibility for violence, neglecting at the same time the political edifice that helps explain uh, that violence in the first place. And then the other scholar whose insight uh, I find quite provocative and quite interesting is uh, Robert Meister, the political theorist, who makes the argument that what the Truth Commission did essentially was that it allowed black South Africans to claim a moral victory over apartheid, but this only after whites had been allowed to claim to have won the Cold War. So blacks win, uh, you know, uh, morally, the war against apartheid, but whites uh, can claim to have won the Cold War, and, and that this is what the Truth Commission essentially, uh, you know, is about, right? And then the third scholar, uh, you know, that, that I want to engage with is, is David Scott, right, who makes the argument uh, quite flippantly, I, 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 you know, I think, that the TRC is nothing more than a symbol of capitulation to a politics bereft of emancipatory potential. Right? That the Truth Commission is what you give people when you can't give them justice. Right? You give them a Truth Commission and say, here, uh, give us forgiveness. Right? This is the best we can do. Uh, this is Scott's, uh, you know, Scott's argument. Uh, and then the last uh, scholar that I want to uh, you know, engage with, and, and this is not a serious engagement. I mean, it's a serious engagement in the work itself, but I want you to keep you know, these insights at the back of your minds as, as, as this talk develops. The last scholar that I want to engage with is, is, is Deborah Posel, right, who makes uh, you know, the, the strong point that the trouble with the Truth Commission report right, was that it sought to offer a moral narrative about the fact of evil in South Africa. Right? And that the report, in fact, reads less as history, uh, but more as a moral narrative. This is their proposal. But much more importantly, she also makes the argument that the trouble with the TRC report was that it invoked racism right, to explain apartheid, but could not explain racism itself. Right? So why was there apartheid according to the TRC report? Well, there was apartheid because there was racism. Right? But how come there wasn't racism, say, in 1910? Right? Because there was racism in 1910, but there wasn't apartheid in 1910. Right. This is the point uh, that, that Debbie Posen uh, is making. And you will see uh, you know, why this matters uh, in, in a second. But now to shift the angle of vision away from these broader concerns that drive this lecture to what's at the heart of the story. So, so this is what drives the story. This is the story I'm trying to tell. And it's a story of these men who some of them are you know, with us today. Uh, and what this means uh, you know, uh, for them, what it means to them, but also much more importantly, what it means for South Africa. Right? And I'm gonna play a two minute clip. Uh, this is a, a video recording from the uh, uh, police in Calgary, Canada. Right? And, and it's uh, in some ways the first reckoning that the character at the center of the story has with his own past. Uh, and so I want you to take it in, in, in those terms. But I just want to play uh, the first two minutes of this video, and, and then I will 
uh, and, and then I'll come back to the lecture. So please just bear with me, just two minutes of this. If you can just have a seat on the couch for me, please. Well, by way of formal introduction, I, I am a police officer. I'm a detective here at the major, with the major crime section. My name is David Burke, and, and you can call me Dave or David here today. Uh, what should I refer to you as? Can you what would you like me to call you? Anything at all. I, I, uh, I'm at the moment a number. You're at the moment a number. No, I don't think so. I think you're at the moment you're a, a person that's under investigation by the Calgary Police Service and you're a human being. Formally arrested. Pardon me? Formally arrested. Yes, yes, under arrest, exactly. Uh, so uh, I want you to call me David here today. Uh, I think you probably know what the, I guess you could say, the rules of engagement are. And what you're going to find out about me is that I treat people with dignity and respect. And I know you are a doctor. Uh, that's my understanding that you're a psychiatrist here in the city of Calgary. And uh, I do want to treat you with respect. So if you would prefer that I call you Dr. Levine, I don't mind that. If you want me to call you by Sir, Aubrey, whatever, whatever you prefer. Whatever you would regard as. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to, I, I, uh, I respect. So I'm going to stop right there. So at the moment, I'm just a number. Right. This is what Levine says. Right. This is what this man says. So at the moment, I'm just a number. And Detective Burke says, no, you're not just a number. Right. You are a suspect, but you're also a human being. Right. So who was this man who wants to be seen as just a number? Right. Who is he? And this is, in some ways, uh, part of what I'm trying to, uh, to, to tell you. The story of who this man is and how he ends up uh, to be in this interrogation room in a police station in Calgary, Canada. Right? So who is Aubrey Levy? Right? So he was born in Johannesburg on December 18, 1938. His father was a, law a lawyer born in Latvia, and his mother was born uh, in, a small town, uh, of, uh, in a small town of Briska uh, in, in the Northern Cape. Levine was something of a child prodigy. Right? He entered the University of Pretoria at the age of 16. He qualifies as a medical doctor in 1963 from the University of Pretoria and obtains a diploma in psychiatry in 1968 uh, from Vets University. He joins the South African Defense Force as a full-time psychiatrist in 1969 at the rank of Commandant. And this is the first such appointment in the SADF, the South African Defense Force, since World War II. And he's promoted to Colonel in 1971. Right? And between 69 and 73, uh, Levine is head of psychiatry at, at the South African Defense Force Military Hospital uh, in Pretoria. Right? And this is what he looks like uh, you know, outside of uh, that interrogation room. Right? This is Aubrey Levine. And here's another picture of Aubrey Levine. So he ends up in that interrogation room because he's arrested. Uh, as you can see from the, you know, the timestamp on that video that I just showed you, he's arrested uh, in 2010, uh, so March 2010. Uh, he's arrested because one of his patients uh, has accused him of uh, sexual assault. And this patient claims that over a period of eight years, uh, Levine uh, you know, had, <clears throat> has been uh, sexually abusing him, uh, sexually molesting him. And this patient has what we might call a problematic background in that he's been, uh, you know, in some ways a client of the, the criminal justice system in Canada. And in fact, it's precisely because of this uh, that he is ordered by a court to see Levine uh, as part of his rehabilitation, as part of his uh, you know, sentence. But, you know, after about eight years of uh, taking abuse from, from Levine, uh, you know, this patient decides that I can't take this any, any longer. And he goes to one of the local spy shops uh, in uh, 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 in, in Calgary and, and buys himself a spy, a uh, 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 fancy watch that has uh, you know, uh, a video uh, recorder. Uh, and so goes to one of his appointments with Levine and video records the assault, video records the encounter. This then becomes the basis of Levine's assault, uh, so assault uh, uh, arrest. 
right? And shortly after the news of his arrest comes out, uh, more than 20 men, uh, you know, come along and say, uh, you know, we were also uh, patients of, of Levine's and we were also, uh, you know, uh, assaulted uh, by Levine. In the end, the court says there's merit for only three of the cases. Uh, and it's on the basis of these three cases that Levine is convicted. Uh, he's convicted uh, and <coughs> sentenced to six years in jail uh, for, uh, you know, for uh, sexual assault. Uh, but what's interesting here is that, like, so this is actually during the moment when, uh, so when Levine is arrested, uh, you know, he plays all kinds of games to delay uh, what for some people is the inevitable. Right? He plays all kinds of games. At one point, he claims uh, to have dementia. Right? And in fact, he finds uh, a psychologist uh, in Canada who, interestingly enough, happens to be a, a former South African, but also happens to be a former member of the South African military, uh, who had also worked as a psychologist for the South, South African Defense Force, a man by the name of uh, Charles Duvet. Finds Charles Duvet to testify in court that uh, Levine can't stand trial uh, because he's incapacitated. Uh, he's got uh, early uh, onset dementia and he's not fit to stand trial. Uh, the judge rejects this uh, and uh, <clears throat> And Levine is convicted. Uh, you know, is convicted in February of 2013, and he immediately appeals against his conviction. Uh, and in April of 2014, the Alberta Court of Appeal dismisses uh, Levine's appeal. In October of 2014, uh, uh, the Supreme Court of Canada dismisses uh, Levine's uh, appeal, and so he actually then has to go to jail. But in the event, he only spends uh, 18 months in jail. Uh, on account of his age, uh, and is released to a halfway house uh, shortly thereafter. Yeah, uh, so so there is, uh, you know, uh, this is at the time when the, he was trying to make the argument that he was too ill to stand trial. Uh, but of course, once the judge rejected that, uh, you know, he became, uh, you know, somewhat sprightly, and dispensed uh, with, the, you know, with the walker. Uh, yeah, but before he arrives in Canada, uh, you know, Levine was uh, in some ways a, a key figure, uh, not the key figure. Uh, I don't want to, you know, blow uh, his reputation beyond what, uh, you know, what it is. But Levine was a key figure uh, in the health sector uh, in South Africa, but also a key figure in the apartheid establishment. And so what you have here is uh, old footage uh, of uh, Levine dishing out expertise on the South African Broadcasting Corporation. So this is, you know, Levine, the psychiatrist, this is Levine, the doctor, uh, who sees himself as, uh, as, as qualified, uh, you know, to dispense, uh, you know, advice on health and associated matters. Uh, and here's another image uh, uh, you know, of, of Levine. Uh, this was, uh, you know, uh, one of the original newspapers in South Africa, uh, and it's Levine and Camp and Gown, and you should read the story. Uh, I should also just acknowledge that a, a lot of the story that I'm telling here is contained in, uh, uh, you know, uh, Facebook uh, uh, entries by some of Levine's victims. Uh, and so this photograph actually comes uh, from this remarkable community on Facebook of Levine's former victims or people who knew uh, what Levine got up to in South Africa, uh, which, which we'll talk about uh, in a moment. And so this is Levine, uh, you, know, uh, you know, primped and preened, uh, as uh, the caption says, uh, uh, back uh, when he was working in Durban. Uh, yeah, because that's the other remarkable thing about, about Levine. Okay, he moves around quite a bit in South Africa. Uh, you know, he works at at least four uh, universities uh, by my account. But the story that I want to tell is about Levine uh, working for the South African military. And so this is Levine uh, in the, uh, the, you know, uh, the Defense Force uniform uh, that he wore uh, uh, at, at one time. Uh, and uh, of course, for his victims, uh, this is actually one of the images uh, that, that comes to mind. So the image of Levine as Dr. Shock. Uh, the image of Levine, right, as this hideous character, you know, who did all kinds of evil things uh, to them as individuals, uh, but to them as a group, right? And so this is from a 2015, uh, you know, a long form uh, article by journalist Richard Poplack uh, in uh, The Walrus, which is in some ways the Canadian equivalent of the New Yorker, right? Mm -hmm. So the idea of Levine as Dr. Shock, and of course, he ends uh, the moniker Dr. Shock because uh, of what he did uh, in his capacity as a psychiatrist uh, in the South African military. Right? And, and we'll talk about that in some of this here. So what were Levine's uh, places of operation? 
right? There were two uh, places of operation, right? Uh, one was the uh, number one military hospital in Pretoria, right? So this is a newer version. This is a newer edifice that's up on a hill. And where he worked is actually at the bottom of a hill. I, I didn't include the photograph here. Yeah. But, you know, this becomes one of his key sites of operation, right? one military hospital, right? And the other site uh, is a military base uh, up in the northern, uh, uh, and I'm going to use the old terminology here, but up in the northern Transvaal called Kriesvaal, right? Uh, this is a, a place very close to Mapungubwe, the famous uh, you know, archaeological site, but also the site uh, of one of the storied archaeological uh, sites uh, in, in Southern Africa. Right? So here's one photograph of Kriyaswald. Uh, it was a military base uh, for, for conscripts. And just to show you where, where, where it is. So if you look uh, at where South Africa, Zimbabwe, and Botswana meet, uh, so you know where the Limpopo and the Shashe meet. It was very close to that, right? So, if you, so if you from the Shashe just go down, uh, you know, it's just below, uh, you know, Mapungubwe, uh, but but you know, part of the co same complex as Mapungubwe, right? Uh, beautiful, beautiful landscapes, uh, but but also in some ways hostile landscapes, right? And the base itself was at least three hundred miles, uh, you know, uh, north uh, of Pretoria, the capital. Right, and just to give you another sense of where this place is, so if you look, uh, you know, uh, on the slide, uh, if you look at where Mapungubwe is, it was just, uh, you know, just below that, right? But also just like see how close it is to Great Zimbabwe, uh, uh, to Mamahwa uh, on the on the Botswana side. So so that's where this place was, right? Uh, and. And of course, part of the story for why this place is there in the first place uh, is a story about conscription in South Africa. Uh, and so just to give you a, a, a very schematic, uh, you know, but also just a very brief history, conscription uh, in the form of national service is introduced uh, you know, to South Africa in 1968, right? Every white man over the age of 16 has to a, register uh, with the military uh, for conscription. And then when they turn 18, they have to uh, you know, serve uh, and terms, you know, the, the terms differ, right? Uh, and in fact, it's estimated that, uh, you know, by the time, so, you know, by the 25 years in which conscription is in place for, for, for white men in South Africa, uh, you know, the average, uh, you know, a conscript has to serve something like 702 days, so 720 days, right? Uh, if you include two years of national service and you include, uh, you know, uh, associated camps, uh, yeah. And it's also estimated uh, by a number of scholars, uh, including uh, the military historian Ian van der Waag, who I'm happy to say uh, is, uh, you know, in, in, in on this webinar, uh, that by the end of apartheid, something like 600,000 white men, uh, you know, had served in the South African military. And that of that 600,000, uh, you know, men, something like 320,000 had seen some sort of action, uh, not necessarily combat, but had seen some sort of action uh, along the border uh, of South Africa. And so this becomes, uh, you know, in a sense, so this becomes uh, Levine's, uh, you know, laboratory. Right, uh, recruits who are you know plumped into this remote uh, you know uh, you know a training camp in the uh, you know in the northern Transvaal, right? And this here is actually a footage uh, taken from uh, an AP uh, documentary about uh, you know Kriesfeld, uh, sometime in seventy two, right? And the brains behind uh, you know Kriesfeld, uh was uh, the South African Defence Force Surgeon General Colin Koki Cockcroft. Right, who was the Surgeon General for the military from 1969 to 1977, right? Uh, and as he puts it in one interview, uh, with the advent of national service, uh, you know, for white men in, uh, in 1968, what he and, uh, and other members of the top brass discover is that there's a lot of drug taking uh, among, uh, you know, potential recruits. Uh, there's a lot of drug taking uh, among conscripts. Uh, and this, you know, uh, you know, threatens to reach epidemic uh, proportions. And uh, this, of course, is untenable for a military that has decided that, it, uh, you know, it's going to conscript only white men, right? And, and so, Hriaswa, you know, very early on becomes this place that is not just a military training camp, but a drug rehabilitation. Uh, you know, camp for the South African Defense Force, right? And, and that's what, uh, you know, Carlcroft has in mind, uh, that, that this place here will be, uh, you know, a rehabilitation center, but also a center that actually turns some of these, uh, you know, uh, you know the conscripts into upstanding members of the South African, uh, you know, military, uh, serving uh, the country and in defense, uh, you know, of the state, right? Uh, and 
given what the place is set out to do, and, and just keep in mind here that, that when the place is set up, uh, there is no mention of dealing with homosexuals. There is no mention of dealing uh, with gay re recruits. This actually comes much later. Right. Uh, initially, the focus is on uh, dealing uh, with, uh, you know, uh, what the top brass see as antisocial behavior. And that includes, uh, but, but initially is actually limited to just drug taking. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, that's. <clears throat> And so that's what the focus is. And so here's, uh, you know, uh, Aubrey Levine leading a therapy session sometime between 71 and 72 at Khrievslat. Uh, uh, so, so he was based in Pretoria and he and a team of, uh, you know, uh, 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 colleagues would fly in every fortnight. Uh, oh, that's what the, you know, the, the, the records say, right? It would fly in every fortnight to conduct, uh, you know, group therapy sessions, but also to, to conduct individual, uh, you know, sessions. And this is where it would appear a lot of the abuse that he actually, <coughs> uh, you know, is known for uh, took place. Uh, and of course, I have, uh, you know, people here who, if they're prepared to talk, can testify to, to, to some of this. Uh, yeah. Uh, and the story of Levine is known among recruits. And in fact, if you look at some of the you know, uh, material from the military archive, uh, there is concern among the top brass, right? That uh, Chriaswald has very quickly earned the reputation of a Friesvald, right? Uh, this is a place full of fear, right? Uh, that, you know, mention uh, Chriaswald as a potential posting to a recruit, uh, you know, fear uh, takes, uh, you know, takes over because of the stories that are filtering through, uh, you know, the conscript ranks about what happens, uh, you know, at this place, uh, about the kind of work uh, that, uh, you know, Dr. Shock, uh, you know, uh, is engaged in. Uh, right, and, and the recruits or the conscripts actually call him Bubbles, because the man had a a a, a penchant uh, a penchant for for bonbons uh, for chocolate, right? Uh, so it's only uh, you know towards uh, you know the end of apartheid uh, that stories start coming out, uh, but they start coming out uh, you know in ways that that are much more vocal than had been the case before. Uh, and, and to be fair, uh, you know, among the first people to mention uh, Levine and what he does uh, is a military in public, uh, you know, former conscripts or people who had left South Africa and chosen to go into exile rather than serve in the military, right? And, and some of them found an organization in the late 70s, uh, you know, called COSO. Right, so the Congress of, of people opposed to war, uh, you know, uh, so but war resistors essentially actually uh, found this organization, and they publish, uh, you know, a pamphlet that details some of what uh, Levine, uh, you know, is up to, uh, you know, in the military, right? And so one of the stories that that, that is told uh, is uh, of Levine, uh, you know, giving, uh, you know, so-called. Uh, uh, deviant uh, conscripts, especially, uh, you know, people identified as gay, uh, people identified as drug, uh, you know, as drug addicts, uh, you know, uh, shock, uh, shock treatment. So electroconvulsive therapy, right, is, is what some scholars would, would say. And I should also say, uh, in support of the, the, the initial story, that this is set up as a drug rehabilitation center, that Levine's own, uh, you know, medical school dissertation is actually on the use of, uh, of uh, cannabis uh, by recruits. Right. Uh, we might quibble with the merits of that story, sorry, of, of the dissertation, but that's what the dissertation is about. In fact, as he himself argues later in his defense, uh, that was actually what the focus of the research at the camp was. Right. Uh, and so here is what, uh, you know, Dr. Shock comes to say is, you know, more and more stories are told in the public domain about what he did, right? Uh, you know, I only gave them drugs, right? I didn't do all these things that I'm accused of doing, right? Is essentially what, uh, you know, what, what Levine said. And I should actually point out here that uh, an interesting backstory is about how Levine comes to leave South Africa uh, for Canada, right? He flees South Africa in 1995. So you'll hear in some accounts that he actually leaves uh, South Africa for Canada because he's running away from the Truth Commission, right? This is actually not true uh, chronologically because he actually leaves before the commission is set up. Right, uh, the commission does come after him. Uh, we'll, and we'll talk about this. Right, so he leaves South Africa in 1995, and of course he later makes the argument that well, I left South Africa because there was just too much crime. I couldn't live there. Like my family wasn't safe. Well, not entirely true. Uh, it, you know, he left so quickly that his own domestic, right, his own domestic, had no idea that the family had left. She shows up for work one day, and the Levins are gone. Uh, there's a new family in the house, uh, and we know the story because that family 
uh, you know, uh, actually employs a domestic, uh, and, and she actually ends up staying with her family for five years. And we also know from this family that takes over the house uh, from Levine in Grahamstown, because uh, she was at Rhodes University and at Fort England, uh, one of the first psychiatric hospitals uh, you know, in South Africa. Uh, we also know that, you know, his own patient was still showing up at the house uh, for their, you know, uh, for their sessions with Levine. So he hadn't even bothered to tell his own patients uh, that he was leaving. So there was a trigger. Uh, there was a trigger that actually led him to flee South Africa. But what, what that is, it, it's not entirely clear. Uh, but it's not a truth commission either. So maybe talk of a commission coming his way, uh, you, know, uh, you know, might have actually uh, you know, uh, triggered uh, his departure. And I want you to make note of what he says in his defense. Right? When more and more stories come into the public domain about what Levine was getting up to in the military, right? Giving, uh, you know, uh, gay recruits, uh, you know, electroshock treatment, uh, you know, abusing, uh, you know, conscripts, uh, you know, given all this, right? He, you know, says in his defense, uh, nobody was given electric shock treatment by me. What we practiced was aversion therapy. We caused slight very slight pain in the arm by contracting the muscles using an, electric, uh, an, an electronic device. Excuse me. Nobody was held against his or her will. We did not keep human guinea pigs like Russian communists. We only had patients who wanted to be cured and were there voluntarily. I think the important thing to keep in mind here is not his denial, right? but the contrast that he seeks to draw between what he did and what he and his colleagues did and what he believed the Russian communists were doing. And of course, we know about the asylum hospitals uh, in the case of the Soviet Union. Uh, we know about the abuse of psychiatry to, in some ways, to demobilize and to uh, delegitimize uh, you know, legitimate protest, right? And so this is what Levine is, is, is referring to. Right? And this is important as a way, I think, of also understanding part of his old view. Right. So how are we to understand Levine? Right? How are we to understand what he did? Right? His abuse of conscripts, uh, you know, in uh, you know, the defense force. Uh, and of course, it wasn't just the defense force uh, where we see Levine abusing, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, conscripts. Right. Uh, there's a case uh, when he's at the uh, University of Natal in 1969 of a father who lodges a formal complaint with the University of Natal, with the hospital in Durban, uh, I believe it was Addington Hospital, but also with the medical Medical and Dental uh, you know, uh, uh, Professions Council, uh, you know, uh, over what he says was uh, Levine's abuse of his son. Right? That case is dismissed. Right? So the stories told about Levine you know, are not in some ways made up. Right? There is, it seems, a pattern that actually goes back some way. Right. So, you know, as early as 69, there's a complaint. Uh, I, 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 no, so, so, sorry, it's not 69. So I apologize. Actually, 1979. 1979 is when we have the first documented, uh, you know, case, right? So how are we to understand, uh, you know, what Levine is doing, but also how are we to understand, uh, you know, what's going on with the military's response to what they see uh, as, as, as a homosexual epidemic, right, to use a term coined by uh, a gender security scholar, right? Uh, I think part of what we need to do in making sense of Levine is to actually situate, uh, you know, Levine, the individual, but also what the South African military, uh, you know, uh, we're doing in a broader uh, global context, right? To understand uh, what's going on in South Africa in light of what's going on in other parts of the world, right? Uh, so keep in mind, for example, that in the case of England, right, it's not until 1967 with the passage of the Sexual Offenses Act, right, that same-sex acts are decriminalized, right? That same-sex acts are, you know, uh, are made legal, right? So this is important to keep in mind. Uh, it's also important to keep in mind that this idea, right, this idea that, uh, you know, you can use something like electroconvulsive therapy to cure people of their gayness is an idea that actually has, uh, you know, a root. Discredited, uh, you know, we know this now, uh, but there was a time when, you know, there were scholars who actually believed this. Right, uh, and so this is important to keep in mind. So this is a piece uh, that's from a magazine called Uncensored, and the issue I have here is uh, October 1969. So this is important to keep in mind. So, so one of the things that uh, Levine says, uh, you know, in his defense, uh, in this five hours. So what I showed you of that video clip from the interrogation, uh, it was just you know two minutes of it's a five hour uh, you know interrogation. Yeah. So one of the things he says uh, in that interrogation is that what he was doing, right, what he was doing in trying to cure people of their gayness was not aberrant, 
right? That it was not isolated, but was in fact part of a global movement. And, and he cites, uh, you know, one of these key textbooks in, 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 in psychiatry. This is Mayan Gross's, uh, you know, uh, classic clinical psychiatry from 1969, where he says, you know, I didn't just make this stuff up, you know, read some of the key literature, uh, you know, on the question of homosexuality, and you will see that, you know, the, the, the idea that you can cure people of, 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 of gayness, uh, you know, is, is quite standard, right? And so this is actually one of the, uh, you know, one of the Texas sites, right? And it's also important to keep in mind here that it's not until 1973, right, that the American Psychiatric Association depathologizes homosexuality in 1973, right? So it's not until, uh, you know, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> three, uh, that, uh, you know, homosexuality is actually taken away as a diagnosis of some sort of pathology, right? So this is important to keep in mind. Uh, one of the things he says, uh, you know, I mean, he says a lot, uh, you know, in his interview with, uh, you know, with the uh, police in Calgary, with, uh, you know, Detective David Burke. And one of the things he says, and I think this is important to highlight, is, is that, uh, you know, what he was doing was, in some ways standard, right? And he mentioned sexologist Domina Rancho, who actually was born in South Africa and then moved to uh, Chicago, right? He says, you know, I brought her to South Africa to give talks. And so what I'm doing is, it's fairly standard, right? And of course, this is his defense for the sexual assault that he actually carries out on his patient. Uh, because one of the questions that's asked is, so if you know, the man is coming in with mental issues, what are you doing playing with his genitals, right? Uh, and, you know, and his response is, well, you know, I was checking for erectile dysfunction. But the response is, well, you know, usually the tests that do that last two minutes, right? You were at it for at least 14 minutes, right? So what's this about, right? And in his defense, it says, no, I am merely following. Uh, I'm not suggesting that Domenico would have endorsed, uh, you know, the abuse. Uh, but, but he makes his argument, right? And he also makes the argument that part of his techniques are drawn from some of the key figures in, you know, in, in, in sexology or sexology studies, right? Uh, and he mentions another South African, Bernard Levinson, uh, you know, whose uh, famous book is called, uh, you know, The Sex Lives of Famous People, right? That I trained under the best. And, and so what I'm doing uh, is not aberrant, right? Why is this important? I think it's, it's important because uh, in understanding Levine and what he does, it's also important thing to understand in some ways that South African exceptionalism cannot take us anywhere uh, if what we're trying to do is to understand why people like him would do what they did, right? Uh, why people like him would emerge. And, and what I want to show, you know, in this lecture is that South Africa was, you know, contrary to the propaganda that we've come to believe because we wanted to believe it, that South Africa was not this isolated pariah, that South Africa was in some ways key to some of the, you know, the arguments that animated the Cold War. Right, that South Africa was a part of this network. And, and Quinn Slobodian in his book, The Globalist, I think does a good job of showing this, right? And just to illustrate this point, uh, but, but before I get into that, I also uh, you know, want to point out that uh, it's important to, you know, to see Levine as in some ways part of the system, but also as an individual, right? Uh, so that it's not just a system we're damning, but also the individual, but, but also that we are attentive to those moments where it's the individual who has to account for something versus the system that has to account for something. So just to illustrate uh, the connectedness of apartheid South Africa to other parts of the world, uh, you know, Milton Friedman, right, is in South Africa in 1976. Right, and of course he then writes a piece saying I abhor apartheid, but I support uh, you know South Africa, right? And, and so in some ways this is typical of the uh, you know liberal conservative position in the U.S. in you know, versus South Africa, right? That as opposed as I am to apartheid, you know I would much rather have South Africa on my side. So Milton Friedman is, is, is one of those who claims he doesn't support apartheid, but he supports South Africa. But it's never clear how he draws a line between the two, apartheid and South Africa, right? Uh, Hayek is in South Africa in 78. And I believe this is not his first visit, right? Again, he's in South Africa in 1978, and he actually makes the argument in this piece here, right? That if there's one place in the world where his theories apply most keenly, it's South Africa, right? Uh, this is just to illustrate the point I'm trying to make about the global connectedness of apartheid South Africa, so that we don't see what Levine is doing, so that we don't see South Africa and apartheid as his outliers, right? As these places that are disconnected from what's going on in other parts of the world. Because the connections, I think, are quite strong, and we need to be attentive to them to make sense of some of what happens, right? And of course, the most famous case here is Samuel P. Huntington, the Harvard political scientist, who actually serves as an advisor to P.W. Porter. Right, in the 1980s, right? This is a man who, uh, you know, says you need both reform and repression, 
right? In a famous address that he gives at the Grand African University uh, in 1981, he makes the argument that what South Africa needs, uh, you know, is this mix of reform and repression, right? And that South Africa can never be a democracy. Right. So those of you who are reading this clash of civilizations, uh, I think it's important to remember some of this earlier, uh, you know, history of his aversion to multicultural, you know, multiracial societies. Right. That this it has a much, uh, you know, deeper root. Right. And it wasn't just on the political economic front that you have these connections. Uh, here's a photograph uh, taken, uh, I believe, at the Wondrous Stadium in Johannesburg uh, of a Billy Graham crusade. Right. This is in 1973. Right. Again, another connection. And what's interesting here is that the South African government actually had to make a special dispensation for black and white to sit together. Right. And of course, Billy Graham milks this for what it's worth. Right. Uh, that you know that my crusades were multiracial affairs. Right. You know, we had blacks sitting on the stage. Right. Uh, you know, Graham will later on say this. And of course, Billy Graham is not the only American who is involved uh, with South Africa. Jimmy Swaggart, you know, who later <coughs> on is discredited, right, uh, you know, is another, uh, you know, a regular visitor to South Africa. Uh, and this is footage from, uh, you know, a famous debate that he gets into with a Muslim scholar named Ahmed Didat in, in, in 1986, where the, the, the motion is, is, is the Bible, uh, you know, God's word. Right. And the debates that have been going on since about who wins that debate, uh, but that's not our interest today. Right. Now back to Khriyev's fault. Uh, I think what's important to, uh, you know, to, 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 to realize, and, and here I want to acknowledge, uh, you know, Dew and McGregor, uh, because I actually found this reference through him. So he has a piece about uh, Khriyev's fault and its attempt at drug rehabilitation. Uh, it, it's from the, uh, you know, uh, magazine called Infantry, which is the official publication of the U.S. Uh, Army Infantry School. Uh, magazine, right? And here, you know, the article is actually lauding the experiment at, uh, uh, you know, at, at Clear Spot, right? that this is something that the American military can learn a thing or two from, right? So again, not some isolated experiment, but in some ways part of this uh, bigger in Kuwait movement. I'm not suggesting that the movement was coherent or consistent, uh, but I think the connections, uh, you know, need to be taken seriously, right? Here, again, taken from the, the Facebook, uh, you know, page, uh, you know, of, you know, people connected to Kriyasvold, is a, a, a photograph taken during uh, the visit of the, uh, you know, French military attaché, uh, Jean-Claude Laguin, uh, in, in 1974, right? Uh, you know, he's a Kriyasvold, so, and he's there with the, the, the commanding officer of the camp. Right. And this is a, a piece, uh, you know, that <clears throat> is published uh, in uh, November of 77, again, lauding, uh, you know, Kriyasvald for, for what it did. Uh, and, you know, like I pointed out, it's certainly true that there was research done, uh, but the merits of that research, uh, you know, the protocols governing that research, you know, are what we need to take into question, uh, you know, are what we, think, sorry, need to call into question. Right. Uh, and, and here, you know, uh, Koki Crawford, who was a Surgeon General, and of course, this is just upon his retirement, uh, you know, he makes the, uh, you know, uh, the, the argument here that, uh, you know, drug taking uh, had become a problem in South Africa. And he, in his words, quote, uh, you know, it was becoming like a fell fire sweeping through the youth of the country. Right. And of course, if your job is to recruit young white men to serve the military, you can't afford uh, to have people taking a drug. I mean, this is the argument he's making. I, I, I'm just you know, paraphrasing here. Uh, I'm not endorsing uh, what he says. But of course, there's more to the story of Free Asphalt uh, than what people at like Cockcroft you know, would want us to believe, uh, than what the Americans and the French were taking from it. Uh, so here uh, is a snippet from a, a secret report, uh, declassified now, uh, from uh, you know, uh, May 1976. Uh, and uh, what I want to show you here uh, is this here. That, so while officially uh, the camp was being lauded uh, for doing all this amazing work, uh, in private, in the correspondence, uh, you know, there were questions uh, about the, this place. Uh, so here is uh, this report from 76, uh, where it says, uh, talking about, you know, Kreisfeld as an operational base, it says, its present location close to international boundaries it makes it vulnerable and operationally unacceptable. Any operation conducted from Cresfold is limited to a range that movement on foot makes possible because of limitations on vehicular uh, movement. The area of influence of operational units at Cresfold is negligible in respect of time and distance. Right? So this place has no strategic worth, essentially, is, is what they say. Right? Uh, you know, and then it goes on to say, uh, and this is actually important. Yeah, so Cresfold company as an operational unit. The national servicemen in Kriyasvold cannot be considered as being operationally ready, 
Right? The main reasons are that the members are unreliable. It is difficult to enforce authority. Should members be issued with live ammunition, the commander's life may be in jeopardy. This means that any operational task as such is to be undertaken by another element. Right? So this is important to keep in mind because in some ways you see, in, you know, uh, you know, in the Sakaba uh, record, uh, a different story, uh, you know, about Kriya's fault. And of course, in some ways, this gets uh, amplified. Uh, in 1977, when a group of uh, conscripts at Kriesfeld crossed the border, I mean, you saw from the map I showed earlier, uh, showing the connection between uh, Kriesfeld and, uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, Botswana and, and Zimbabwe, or it was Rhodesia at the time. But you see what happens uh, here uh, when a, a group of conscripts cross over into, uh, you know, into Botswana and rape a, a woman who was pregnant, uh, 20, uh, I think it was 32 weeks pregnant, right? Uh, and this then, you know, causes an international, uh, you know, incident. Yeah. So I've been giving you a lot of detail. So what is the significance of this and, and, and why does it matter? Right? I think it's important uh, because when you go back to the criticisms of the Truth Commission that I began with, what people are grappling with, what scholars are grappling with is the relationship between structure and agency. So the extent to which apartheid explains everything and the extent to, uh, to which individual choices explain everything. So it's an old fashioned problem between structure and agency. Right. So to what extent do we understand Levine, the individual, and his aberrations, right? And, and to what extent do we use the structure of apartheid to explain uh, you know, Levine's actions? I think the important thing here is to you know, see the marriage, uh, to go back to the Jam Kutsia quote, to see the marriage of passion and power. Right? That is pretty obvious, you know, from what happens in the court in Canada, from what happens with his patients, from what happens, you know, with the first complaint we have in 1979, that this was a man who, uh, you know, in, in the words of, of one of his victims, who was quite sick, right? That this was a man who was doing all kinds of bad things, right? But doing them, and it's important to, to, to emphasize this, but doing them because he could get away with it, right? So the marriage of passion and power, so what happens when you give an individual like Aubrey Levine power over conscripts, right? And, you know, one of the arguments he makes in his defense is that, you know, uh, you know the people that I exper experimented on, the people that I treated, you know, gave their consent, right? But of course, these were 17-year-olds, right? These were 18-year-olds. These were young boys. I mean, these were young men. Right? So how then do you understand, uh, you know, consent in that context, right? In an isolated military camp, right? Where you have to obey the commands of your seniors, right? This is important to keep in mind, right? So someone like Levine comes along and in some ways preys on this, right? So that he can prey on the conscripts, right? Under his watch, right? There's another important story that I think Levine uh, and the saga of Levine tells us, right? And that is, how we understand the 68 moment, right? I mean that era of global protest and global revolt, right? And what that says to us about drugs and drug taking, what it says about sexual liberation and sexual freedom, but also what it says about the coming into their own of, uh, you know, all kinds of sexualities, right? As, 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 as public expressions, right? And what's important here uh, to, to remember uh, is that Instead of reading the 68 moment as this you know, movement of progressive development of progressive politics, it's also important to remember that there was also counter reaction right, to this movement, that the right was as uh, active as the left was. Right? So while the left might have grabbed all the headlines, there was also a lot of ferment among the right. right? And so Levine then can be located in some ways in this camp of counter reaction to what's happening, uh, you know, in uh, 68, uh, you know, understood as the era of protest, as the era, you know, of, of free love, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, and then there's also, I think, another complicated but also controversial point to make, and that's that we also have to grapple with what would have been the relative legitimacy of apartheid within South Africa itself, right? The ways in which increasing numbers of white South Africans over time uh, supported apartheid. That this is important. Because yeah. one of the initial questions I had uh, when I was working on this research was to ask the question, so wait, why did you go into the military in the first place, right, when it was an apartheid military? But then I realized, like, I was asking the wrong question, right? Because the people who resisted going into the military actually were the exception. They were not the norm. The norm was to go into, uh, you know, into, uh, into the apartheid military, right? Because that was a socialization, right? That was the expectation. Uh, and, and, you know, many young men took this seriously, right? This doesn't make it right. It doesn't mean I agree with it, but I think this is important uh, to keep in mind, yeah. And just one, you know, illustration of 
the right wing thrust of the 68, you know, 68 moment in the context of South Africa. Right? This is a letter that Levine writes to the Secretary of Parliament, and the letter is dated the 28th of February, 1968. Right? And he's writing to the Secretary of Parliament because the Minister of Justice has just instituted a select committee to reconsider amendments to the, uh, to, to reconsider, uh, you know, uh, amendments to the uh, Immorality Act. Right? And he wants to reconsider uh, these amendments, uh, you know, because he wants to make the act uh, that regulates so-called immorality acts much more explicit in its curbing of what he sees as a homosexual epidemic. Right? He wants to make the act much more uh, in tune with what he sees as this rise of lesbianism and, and, and homosexuality, to use his terminology. Right? And so Levine, unprompted, writes to the Secretary of Parliament and says, I want to come in as a witness. Right? And what's the basis of his wanting to come in? He says, oh, well, because I have in my practice been curing uh, you know, gay people and I've met with some success, as the letter says. Right. Yes. Yeah, so he says, you know, I have in the course of my work, uh, both in general uh, practice and in the psychiatric department uh, of the General Hospital Johannesburg, as well as uh, Sterkfontein Hospital, treated many homosexuals and lesbians and have enjoyed some measure of success in therapy. Right. So this is, in some ways, what uh, you know, uh, you know, what, what Levine, uh, you know, is feeding on. So enough of this bad stuff about Levine. Uh, so why does this matter, right? And, and in what way is this history, right? And here I want to turn to this challenge uh, that uh, you know Bill Freund issued uh, in 1994. You know, Bill Freund makes uh, you know the, the argument right, that too much writing, uh, you know, history writing in South Africa is beholden to the struggle. You know, as I was pointing out earlier, and he says, personally, I hope that whites will continue. Right. So this is uh, you know, him uh, towards a conclusion. Uh, personally, I hope that whites will continue to write about blacks, although they must take their chances in terms of insight and knowledge of their subject, but also that blacks will start to write about whites and that both will explore the other as well as search inside themselves. Right. So this is my challenge. Right? This is my challenge. Because part of what I have to do in trying to tell the story of Aubrey Levine and what he does to a group of young uh, you know, uh, white men is uh, to be self-aware of my own blackness. Right, as, as a political category. I, I don't want to essentialize blackness here. Uh, I don't want to make it, uh, you know, a bare, you know, moral, uh, you know, worth it that, that they might not have uh, or do more work than actually is capable of doing as a political category, right? And, and so I come at this uh, story as, as, a, as a black South African, but also come at it as a historian. Uh, and, and here, I want to use the Levine story in some ways to respond uh, to this constant lamentation in South African historiography about the absence of black historians. You know, uh, going as far back as, uh, uh, you know, as, as uh, the first decades of, <clears throat> sorry, I just want to give you the, you know, the, the quote here. So in 1919, for example, you know, so John Duber, the founder, president of the ANC, you know, makes the argument uh, in an editorial, uh, you know, in his newspaper, and he says, and I'm quoting here, if there were native historians, surely we would be reading a different history to what is doled out to us. Right. Most of the facts we know about the Zulu War are totally diverse to those given in histories written by Europeans. Right. This is you know, John Duba, and this is constant. This just keeps going on. That this lamentation that if only we had enough black historians, if only we had enough black historians, our history might be different. Our history telling might be different. Right. And the question I have, and I'm, re I'm, I'm you know, reaching my conclusion here, and the question I have is what would that difference look like? So what might histories told by black historians, right? You know, however defined, you know, uh, you know what might those stories look like, uh, and, and what might those histories do to the historiography? Right? So what would they add? And I want to say this as, as a word of caution because it seems to me that there's a perception that if only black historians were writing, right, then the history would be different. Uh, this perception, I think, is founded on this myth that there is some archive out there that is available only to the black historian, again, broadly defined. Right? And I'm not sure about this. Right? I'm not sure about this easy assumption that black perspectives uh, open up automatically to different archives. And this is part of what I, you know, I have to grapple with. Right. So how do I then, as a black historian, uh, sorry, a black historian, uh, you know, tell the story of Aubrey Levine in ways that honor the memory of his victims, but also in ways that acknowledge the pain and the trauma of, of, of his victim, right? And here I have to engage seriously with the role of, uh, you know, white men in South Africa, right? Laurie Nathan, 
you know, asked the question uh, in his submission to the Truth Commission in 1997. Right? He said, were white conscripts uh, into the apartheid military victims or perpetrators? Right? And I want to quote what he says. Uh, and so he starts with this question. So were conscripts victims or perpetrators? In particular, were white conscripts who served in the Defense Force victims or perpetrators? In my view, there is no neat, clean-cut answer to this question. The conscripts who served in the Defense Force were clearly both victims and perpetrators. Right. This is what uh, you know Nathan says. Right. Uh, and, and so this is what I want to take on board. Right? But it's also what I want to take on board in ways that allow me to complicate. Uh, to go back to one of my earlier you know, uh, observations, to complicate this easy conflation of apartheid with racism. Right. To see what apartheid looks like, to see what our understanding of apartheid, uh, you know, might be, if we without minimizing the effects of racism, because these are serious, right? But if we take seriously race as a construct, but also race as a common sense that develops over time. So how do white South Africans come to white South Africans? And the military has an important role to play in this, right? In the socialization of uh, people classified white into a particular identity, right? The military is absolutely key here, right? And this, we cannot, uh, you know, miss for a second. You know, as I was pointing out earlier, 600,000 white men served the apartheid military, right, uh, through conscription, right? And this is important to keep in mind. So the socialization that comes out of that, right? But rather than just take it for granted that every white person who served in the, you know, in the military was a, was, 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 a, was a perpetrator, what happens when we bring someone like Aubrey Levine and his venality and his uh, crimes into that story? Right. What happens to this relationship between victim and perpetrator? So that's some of what I want to do. And in conclusion, I want to show you just two photographs. Uh, there's a subtext to the story that I can't quite uh, get a handle on. Right? So this is what Kreiswald looks like today, right? And I'm using this, uh, you know, picture, Kennedy of Sean Driven. Uh, yeah. Uh, so this is what Kreiswald looks like today, right? And of course, as I pointed out to you earlier, it's also very close uh, to to Mapungubwe. Right? So Kreiswald has itself become an archaeological site. Right? So what sort of digging, right? what sort of digging does Kreiswald call for? Right? It obviously can't be the same sort of digging that has been going on at Mpungubwe, right? It has to be a different kind of digging. Right? But what might that digging uh, lead us? And this is my final slide. I want to conclude with this here. Yeah. This is a comment made in passing by a woman named Susan van der Marwe. Uh, to the TRC in 1996. Susan's husband uh, was a farmer uh, in Tabazimbi, and <clears throat> so close to the border uh, with, with Mozambique. Uh, and, and the husband was killed uh, by a group of uh, ANC uh, guerrillas, right? Except his body was never found. And the only reason we know what happened to the, to the husband is because uh, you know, one of the uh, one of the killers was captured by the security police and uh, actually was turned, uh, you know, to use uh, you know what terminology, and started working for the police. And and so he's the one who actually told the security police what happened uh, to uh, Susan van der husband, right? And this is what she says, uh, you know, in her testimony uh, to the Truth Commission. She says, "My story and that of my children is but a minor story uh, in comparison with these others for whom we feel sympathy." Our pain is but a mere drop in the ocean of South Africa's suffering, right? And the question I want to conclude with is, so what happens when we take seriously the pain of someone like Susan van der Marwe, right? What happens when we take seriously the pain of the man who suffered at the hands of, uh, of, of Levine, right? And this is a question I want to conclude with. So, so, thank you. Okay, thank you, Jacob, for that very provocative and thought-provoking talk. Um, as we mentioned at the beginning of our session today, there are two ways to ask questions. One is in the Q&A function and the other where you can type them out. And the other is by raising your hand and I will call on you and I will try to moderate this as best as possible. So um, with that said, I'm going to open this up and feel free to use either of those two methods to ask um, Jacob a question. We'll give everyone a couple seconds to gather their thoughts.
while people do that, I will I will start Jacob and ask you a question. Um, you towards the end of your talk, you um, you posed the the question of what might um, histories written by I think black historians look like or something to that effect in the, in the context of South Africa. Of course, this is um, a question that I think is more broadly applicable to the continent as a whole and, per, and perhaps even um, beyond including the history of the United States. And it's a question we're all um, asking in perhaps more urgent ways right now. Um, so um, without asking you, you know, to answer that question because it, it's very complicated, I wanted to push you a little bit on it, you um, you you suggested that well, there is the assumption in asking that question that um, somehow a new archive will open up to black historians, um, and that's one way of thinking about what uh, perhaps right and, and what um, a, a histories written by black historians might look like. Um, but there are others too. I mean, it could be the sorts of conceptual questions you ask. It could be the sorts of uh, methodological approaches that you adopt. It could be the sort of analytical frameworks that you um, use, or perhaps more importantly, it could be the intellectual traditions that you're drawing upon, which might um, have some substantial differences depending on where you were raised and what sorts of schooling you had growing up. So I was just wondering if you could comment um, a little bit more to sort of parse that question out a little bit to give us a sense of what you're thinking um, might be some sort of answer to that question. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Neil, thank you for, for, for that question. I, I do not have a clear, straightforward answer, but I, I think it is important to, in some ways, be suspicious right, of the implicit tendency, I think, to, to essentialize blackness right, uh, in ways that make it sound as if you know, there's a particular experience that will then give you a you know, particular access to, uh, you know, to, you know, a different kind of archive. And the, the concern I have with that is, is that it's almost implicit in a lot of, oh, if only we had more black historians, right? And I'm not, you know, at, at a political level, I support the project, right? At a political level, I'm in favor of having many more voices, right? Yeah, we need more black historians, you know, we need more, you know, uh, you know scholars of color, you know, we need, uh, you know, we need more women, you know, we need, you know, you know, people come, you know, uh, you know, with, with different genders, you know, I, I, I'm in support of that, you know, in, in support of the political, right? But where I am cautious is in the assumption, again, it's, it's implicit, so, so my argument is not fair. Uh, it's implicit, and that's that uh, if only, you know, there were black historians, then the history would be different, right? Uh, and what I want to know is, what would that difference be, and what would it look like, right? So would my writing about Aubrey Levine, right, and his white victims, right? And these are, you know, and these are white victims if we use apartheid uh, terminology uh, and, and, uh, and, and coding, right? So, so what would this do, right? Would this then be satisfactory, right? Would this count as black history or would it count as a different kind of history, right? I take your point about, you know, different people bringing in, you know, different conceptual tools. I, I, I take that, right? But I think that's much more individual, you know, it's, it's in some ways it's much more static, much more stylistic than, than, than it is something deeper, uh, you know, than it is something, something deep-seated. And this is for the simple reason that, that, you know, increasingly we are trained in the same way, right? Uh, we all have to learn the same languages, depending on where we work in the world, obviously, right? And, and so the training we get in some ways is similar, right? It doesn't mean that the experience we bring is similar. It doesn't mean that at all. And of course, that has to come into the story, right? What experience you bring with you. Uh, but I think it is important to, to just to, to be suspicious of the tendency to, to assume that blackness will unlock, uh, you know, some long lost archive somehow. Thank you. Um, I have a question here in the Q&A that, that I'm going to read for you. Um, this is from Paul Lando. Um, Dr. Delamini is dealing with the victimization of white men. If race was a common sense developed over time, we must still square that with apartheid's massive attack on a common urban citizenship in the early 1960s, the attempt to affect the erasure of a public future for everyone. It is in the wreckage politically that apartheid is assembling itself. Neil Royce on the massive employment of the civil service. Blackness is made of exclusion radically then. And then Paul says, sorry, a long thought. <laughs> sorry. 
Yeah. So, so Dr. Landa, so, so, you know, thanks for that. You know, th thanks for that thought. And of course, you know, complicating our understanding of apartheid, you know, doesn't mean absolving apartheid of its crimes, right? It doesn't mean absolving, uh, you know, guilty parties, uh, you know, of uh, you know of, of what they did, right? Uh, apartheid was a cr criminal enterprise. There's no doubt about it, right? Apartheid was, uh, you know, uh, you know, was was a system without a moral center. This is important. Right, uh, and it's something I think we have to acknowledge uh, at all times. Uh, but part of what I'm trying to do here is to understand how someone like Aubrey Levine, right, someone like Aubrey Levine and his crimes, which in some ways are individual crimes, right, which in some ways are, 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 you know, are personal crimes, right? And of course, what makes them possible is the system within which he operates, right? But how we understand uh, you know, what someone like Levine gets up to in, in ways that actually allow us to shine better light on what apartheid was and how apartheid functioned, right? And so this is where I want to marry the passions uh, to uh, the power, I mean, I want to marry passions to power, right? As a way of getting a better handle on what apartheid was and how apartheid functioned. Thank you. Um, Heinz Klug has a question and he's going to ask it himself. <laughs> Hi, yes, I did want the opportunity uh, to ask the question because first of all, um, I'd like to say that uh, to Jacob Blamini, uh, your books are fantastic. Um, and one of them raises the question for me and that is when one thinks about Ascari, uh, it does seem like that a, it took a historian like yourself to get access to the various parts of that story that was made it so powerful. Um, so that's just a, an observation on that regard. But I think in, this, in terms of this new project, which I do think is quite fantastic, uh, it was really wonderful. Um, I found really interesting, and I'd like you to say a little bit more about the point that you made about the links between uh, the regime, the apartheid regime and the global post-1968 rising right-wing uh, movement. Um, you mentioned uh, the visits by Milton Friedman, Hayek, the role of Sam Huntington, etc. But then also in your discussion of Levine, you talk about the fact that uh, he seems to be aided by these former South Africans who end up in Canada. Uh, so this network uh, in, in, at various different levels is something interesting which you're pointing to, and uh, I wonder if you'd say a little bit more about it. Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, Dr. Tukalva, th thank you for, for, for your compliments, and, and, and thank you for, uh, for this wonderful question. So, I think one way to, 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 to express what I'm trying to do here by pointing to these connections is to, to challenge the exceptionalism that is still a hallmark of South African historiography. Right. This idea that South Africa was so different, right? So you know the whole world is moving in one direction uh, after you know the horrors of the Second World War, right? And South Africa is marching in the opposite direction, right? Uh, that you know while the world is seeing the light and, and and you know marching to the beat of progress, South Africa is doing something different, right? So that exceptionalism, right? The exceptionalism that also you know not only makes that claim but but also says that you know everything about South Africa is different, right? So you know we're not like the rest of Africa, right? That, that we have nothing to do with the rest of Africa. That exceptionalism, I think, is, is another handicap that, that we need to, uh, you, know, uh, you know, deal with. And I think this is one way of dealing with that, you know, by pointing to these connections and saying, in trying to make sense of Levine and, and his own rationale, because right? so this is part of what I'm trying to do, and this is where it gets complicated, because I, I damn the man, right, uh, you know, but, but I also want to take him at his word. I want to hear how he explains himself, how he explains his actions. Uh, but in understanding him, I also want to make it clear that uh, looking for the exceptional in Levine uh, is not a helpful way of actually getting a, a, a handle on apartheid or what apartheid was. Right? And that part of what we have to do is in some ways to put him in context. Right? And so these networks become important right? because these networks don't go away. Right. I'm not suggesting, because I don't know if I have the evidence for this, but I'm not suggesting that uh, there is a connection, for example, between, you know, Aubrey Levine and, and Charles Devet, right, who testifies in court and says, you know, this man has dementia, he can't stand trial, right. But I do find it striking that both share this background uh, in, uh, you know, in the mind sciences within the apartheid military, 
right? I, I think that is important. Uh, and I also find it quite striking. So he, Charles Devet makes an appearance in a documentary by Taron uh, in a, a Crossman, uh, you know, where he says, uh, you know, uh, Levine believes is being persecuted. And, and, and I think there's something to that. Uh, and, and I think I have to, you know, pay attention to that. How you know regimes of justification you know cross borders, right? How they come to explain, uh, you know, the aberrant. Uh, so, so this is important. Uh, and just to go back to, to to something that I think Paul Landa said. Uh, yes, Levine's victims were you know white men, but but I don't know if seeing this as just you know a focus on white victims is is, is helpful, right? Uh, I think much more helpful would be to look at this as as a, as a broadening of our perspective. And, and asking of a question like, what happens when we take seriously the pain, not just of the black victims of apartheid, but also of white people who suffered in apartheid? And if there's a connection between this and my work on collaboration, for example, so on black collaborators with apartheid, it's that to understand black collaborators, I think it's important to understand that part of what's going on, uh, you know, uh, within black collaboration project defined is a struggle over the very definition, the very content of blackness, right? So when one black person calls another black person a Judas, right? There's something going on here. It, it's something that for me says, you need to pay attention to the struggle over the meaning of blackness, right? So don't assume that you know what blackness is. And then this certainly I think is a tendency in a lot of the scholarship to just assume that, well, if you black and work with the security police then you must be a collaborator. That's too easy a jump, right? Because what it does essentially is to essentialize, uh, you know, blackness, essentialize race, right? To make it seem as if your race, uh, whatever that is, should automatically determine your political loyalties, right? When that is not the case, and that should not be the case. The sad truth is that there were many black people who supported apartheid, and we have to grapple with that. We have to deal with that, uh, is, is what I'm trying to do. Uh, thank you, Jacob. Um, Jacob, there are a couple of questions in the Q&A. Um, if you can see this, the first one by Julie Parle from South Africa. And perhaps I don't need to read all of these since uh, everyone can see them, I think. But she's asking you a question to, about pushing back the history of psychiatry in South Africa to, uh, you know, the uh, early 19th century obsession um, with white men rather than the African other. So uh, yeah, if you want to respond to that one first. I think you're muted, Jacob. I, mean, I, I should actually point out that, that you know that, that one of the standards, you know, one of the classics in the history of mental, uh, you know, health and mental health, uh, you know, uh, you know, mental illness in South Africa is Julie Powell's state of mind. Uh, so, so, so thank you for that. And of course, one of the interesting things that, that you know, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Powell makes in, in, you know, in, in her work on mental health and mental illness is that, remarkably, uh, even though you know, there is this commonsensical assumption about, you know, why it's being civilizationally superior uh, to blacks uh, or Europeans being, you know, superior to natives, et cetera, et cetera. There is still this odd thing where it's the whites who are most, uh, you know, likely to succumb to mental, you know, to, to mental health issues, right? So how you deal with this? And, and, and Tiffany Jones, I think, builds on this uh, to also make the argument that, that, you know, what's interesting about, you know, men, the history of mental health uh, in South Africa, is that for the longest time, you know, the intended target are white men, right? Uh, women are excluded, uh, you, know, not, you know, not by design, but, but you know, by effect, women are excluded, uh, you know, the so-called natives are excluded, but over time they get brought into the system. Right? And this is something I think important to think about, but also to think with, right? How do we, uh, it's almost, if, if I push this back to the 19th century, uh, you know, what happens to our understanding of the figure of the white man? Right, is that figure through which to understand some of the workings of segregation and later on apartheid? Uh, yeah, but I mean, these are questions that, that I need to take on board. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Jacob, there's another question in the Q&A from Brandon Hawkinson about um, one of the questions you raised at the end of your talk about what are we supposed to do with these really problematic historical figures? How do we approach them as scholars? Yeah. So, I, so Brendan, I thank you for that question. Uh, the, I'll tell you where that question comes from. So where this question comes from is in the Truth Commission's failure to deal uh, with uh, Aubrey Levine. Right? He's one of the few people, by the way, who is mentioned by name in the Truth Commission's final report. 
right, uh, as having done something that, that, that needs further investigation, right? So one of the few people mentioned, uh, you know, in, in the Truth Commission report, he's also among the 50 or so doctors, right, who were identified by healthcare activists and healthcare professionals as having a case to answer. So these were names that were, you know, given to the Truth Commission, uh, where they said, these are doctors who have something to answer for their complicity, but also for the criminal conduct under apartheid. Right, uh, but none of that seem you know, seem to work. Uh, and, and and curiously, when the Truth Commission does eventually get hold of Levine, uh, you know, in Canada, his response to the commission is, is very legalistic. Right, that you haven't given me sufficient time to actually make all the preparations I need to consult all the files I need to look at, uh, so that I can come and defend myself. Right, that that, that you haven't given me, uh, you know, uh, you know, the benefit of due process. Right, this is his argument. Right, it's, it's a very legalistic argument, and in some ways, the Truth Commission, I think, you know, goes along with this. Right, and, and so. The reason I ask that question is, is, do I then do the same thing? Do I then, as the historian coming along much, much later, do I then extend Levine the same courtesies of you know, due process, whatever that might be in the case of a historian and a subject, right? Or do I go ahead and say, well, you did wrong, that you are a convicted sex offender, uh, that you, know, you have a trail of tears behind you, that you have a trail of trauma behind you, right? That came at the hands, uh, you know, the, sorry, that they came at your hands, right? So, so this is what I'm trying to do here. That, that what is different between a historian trying to get at the truth about the past versus the Truth Commission trying to get at the truth about the past, right? Uh, when what you're looking at is this problematic individual who did wrong, and we know he did wrong. So that's where that question comes from. So, Brendan, I'm not answering your question, but I'm throwing another question at you uh, in response. Thank you. Do we have other questions? Either in the type type of questions or questions you'd like to ask yourself? I believe we have a question from Scott Strauss. Oh, okay, sorry about that. Um, from Scott, I greatly enjoyed your talk and the way that you presented it, thank you. I wonder if you could build on your question regarding writing about perpetrators and evil in history. I don't think you used the term evil, but you get the point. Do you have further thoughts on how to write about perpetrators, the risks and benefits therein? Are there studies of perpetrators in Africa that would serve as a model or as a no-go? My sense is that you are interested in the higher level perpetrators like Levine, but the way that you ended focused more on lower level perpetrators. Anyway, I'd be grateful for any further thoughts on perpetrators in particular in the context of Africa. Yeah. I'm a <laughs> So, so thank you for that, uh, you know, layered question. Right? I, I, it's not an easy question. So I, uh, I mean, the, the one text that comes immediately to mind, uh, you know, would be King Leopold's ghost, right? But even there, you know, uh, King Leopold is, in some ways, is physically distant, right? That he's not there at the center of his own operations. Uh, so, so that's not a good model, uh, you know, to, 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 to look at. Uh, I don't know if, if Aubrey Levine is a low level perpetrator, right? Uh, this man was a kennel after all, right? A university professor, right? And, and I think these are important, uh, you know, positions that, that we need to, uh, to be attentive to. Uh, so I don't know. And of course, I mean, part of what, you know, uh, what I'm doing here is to give you this very raw material in hopes that your questions uh, and, and your insights will help me develop uh, something much more substantial, right? Uh, so I don't know if, if there are models. I mean, there are models. Uh, so for example, uh, you know, coming out of Nazi Germany, right? Uh, and, and Daniel Lee, I think, has, has, has a book uh, about a Nazi officer. Uh, and uh, this was, uh, you know, told to me recently by a colleague. I haven't had a chance to read that book, uh, but I'm looking forward to that. Uh, and, and I imagine there's more uh, coming out of, uh, you know, coming out of the Holocaust, uh, you know, there's, there's more coming out of, uh, uh, you know, the Second World War that actually might be helpful, that might be useful. Uh, and in the case of South Africa, I mean, a number of scholars have also, you know, pointed out the, the, the dynamic of victim perpetrator, right? Uh, in the case of the civil war that affected, uh, especially black South Africa, right? Uh, towards the end of apartheid, right? That 
it's not helpful to just focus on the victim versus the perpetrator. That, that oftentimes the victim was also the perpetrator uh, and that depending on the context, right, the same person occupied different positions and that this is something that we have to grapple with uh, as we try and make sense of the civil war that between 1987 and uh, you know, 1994 claimed something like 12,000 lives in South Africa. So I don't have a, a straight answer, but, but, but I think the, 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 the literature coming out of the Second World War and the Holocaust is instructive. Neil, you're muted. Okay, I was saying thank you. And we probably have time for one more question if there is one out there. Um, so a question just came through in the Q&A, Jacob, and um, it's a short one, I can read it. Um, but how is this how is your story different from what colonial medical doctors did in, say, West Africa? Yeah. I mean, I, I guess I'd have to know what, what the what the person is referring to specifically, uh, so I can uh, so so I I, I I can respond to that. Uh, I mean, if but but if the question is is uh, you know how is this different from colon, colonial science, right? Where uh, in the case of sleeping sickness, for example, you know, German, uh, you know, German medical officers were conducting experiments that were blinding people uh, without, it seems, too much care about the side effects of what they were doing. Like, I mean, if, if, if that's what you mean, uh, then, then I think there's something there, right? I, I, think, I, I think there's something there. Uh, you know, does it... You know, does it drop to the same level of of, of abuse as what Levine was doing? Because I mean, let's let's not forget for a second that what Levine was engaged in. So you know, so so leave aside his his uh, interest in drugs, right? Uh, that, that what he was engaged in was was, was 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 essentially sexual abuse, right? And he you know had unlimited access to uh, recruits. You know, you know, men as young as seventeen, men as young as eighteen, and, and took full advantage of that. Uh, so is, is you know is this the same thing as the Germans conducting uh, you know sleeping sickness experiments uh, in West Africa? I I'm, I'm not sure, but but I, I think that's an important uh, you know point of reference, and and I, I take that on board. Well, thank you, Jacob. I think we are out of time, unfortunately, but this has been um, wonderful, and thank you for your willingness to participate in this uh, first virtual Africa at noon in the beginning of this new version of this tradition and. Um, from my, from where I'm sitting, I think it went relatively well from the technological perspective. And thank you for for letting us um, listen to this this fascinating project. Yeah, I, I mean, again, thank you so so much for you know for tuning in, and Neil, thanks for the invitation. Your generosity is amazing. So I appreciate that. Uh, Aliyah, Diana, thanks for making this happen. I, I really appreciate this. Uh, and of course, I want to thank uh, you know the many of you who you know who showed up, uh, especially the. The people for whom this is a personal story. Uh, I, I, I have to acknowledge uh, your experience and I have to acknowledge your pain. I can never be in your shoes, uh, but, but uh, I think your willingness to tell the story uh, is, 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 is nice to be acknowledged. So, so thank you for that. Thank you, everyone. We'll see, hopefully see a bunch of you next week. <laughs> thank you. Bye.